Could you have a trauma bond? Do you know how to recognize the top signs that you're struggling with one? In this episode, Tara and I interview Lisa Sunny, relationship coach and a trauma bond specialist who shares the ins and outs of a trauma bond and how to break one if you recognize that you have one. So I'm so excited today that we have a guest, which is unusual for Tara and I. We are introducing Lisa Sunny, and we're going to be talking about trauma bonds, not just what are they and what's the stages, but what does it feel like when someone is having a trauma bond happen to them, and how do you know when you're actually breaking one? So I'm going to let Tara introduce Lisa, and then we're going to launch into this topic. As a survivor of domestic assault and narcissistic abuse, Lisa's firsthand experience has led her to where she is today, a certified life and relationship coach who helps clients of all genders and walks of life overcome challenges stemming from traumatic partnerships. Her expertise is geared towards getting clients to a good space in their lives and within themselves. She is the author of multiple books, online courses, including the Trauma Bond Recovery Course, and she's a content creator. Thank you so much, Lisa, for being here. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's awesome to be here um, and talking about my most favorite subject. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how did you actually become focused on trauma bonds specifically? Uh, it was my own personal experience with a narcissistically abusive relationship that really led me to dive into the the awareness of of why people stay I, I it was a real need of myself to figure out what kept me in that I had always felt like I was too smart you of course find out that education has absolutely nothing to do with it um intelligence is not it's not is not a factor but mm -hmm. it was this 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 need for me to understand why I stayed that led me to want to understand why do people stay and while not everyone who stays, um, or struggles to leave is in a trauma bond. Um, many people are, and it's not something that people know about. You know, it gets. I I actually remember conversations with my own abuser talking about like I feel like I have Stockholm syndrome. I just don't understand. You know, and he would just roll his eyes like, "Oh, okay, I'm your captor," and and think it was this ridiculous thing. But as it turns out, there's such a similar dynamic to exactly that. Yeah. So what were you feeling that you knew something's wrong, that this was not a normal connection in a relationship? Well, in fairness, a lot of it felt normal, not good, but normal, uh, even though it absolutely I will I will unequivocally say it is not normal. But for me, what I was feeling at the time when I when I really felt like I could not leave was this feeling of being stuck. So if you I, I would typically say to people, if you feel trapped, that's a huge part of it. I felt like I loved him and I hated him. He was the knife. He was the Band-Aid. He was the comfort. He was the pain. I couldn't leave. The thought of leaving, I would sometimes have panic attacks. Um, I lost sleep over it. I just, the thought of leaving, to say that it was overwhelming feels like not the right word, but um, it felt impossible. Leaving, no, that's not an option. Um, I loved him too much. So you do feel like you love the person and you also kind of often feel like you hate them. There can often be even um, this feeling of of it's it's more than just love and hate. It's 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 you. You empathize with them so much from knowing what they've been through that you start to feel what they feel to a degree that's more that more empathy than you could ever have imagined having for another person but you you're like making excuses whether it's he or she in my case it was he but he he just doesn't know what love is you feel like you're abandoning the person you feel guilty for even thinking about leaving when they've been through so much or you've been through so much together when have you been through so much together or have they put you through so much that you've you know sort of I'm air quoting um overcome together but have you you know they, they've put you through this abuse and every time you overcome these big explosive or, or highly emotional um, arguments you feel like we've overcome something and I think it bonds you further but ultimately you just feel like you can't leave you know you need to parts of you know that the logical part of your brain is saying leave you you need to leave this is wrong this is bad you may even have friends and family telling you to leave 
but you may also be hiding what's really going on from your friends and family. And I think if you start to notice that you are unable to share the truth with friends and family, if you feel like you're trying to protect them, I think people protect for two reasons. One, they're protecting the the reputation of your partner, but you're also pre- protecting your own reputation because if you stay, if you don't actually leave, then people are going to look at you like you're insane for staying in a relationship that you yourself have described so poorly. So all of these feelings, it's just this state of confusion. You just don't, you don't know what you're doing here. You, you, you struggle to sort of reconcile why you're still in the relationship. Uh, okay. I'm really glad you mentioned that empathy piece because I think it's really important to recognize that it's, it's, it is beyond just normal empathy. It's empathy at a cost or at a sacrifice. So what are... So you mentioned that extreme empathy. You mentioned feeling stuck, uh, unable to share with friends. What would you consider other traits that someone might be able to recognize and point to if they are in cur- currently in one? Um, I think the confusion around the hot and cold. So when I mean confusion, truly we're talking about cognitive dissonance. But if you don't recognize that as a term when you're in it, it's the absolute confusion where you are feeling like you're on eggshells. You don't know what version of them you're going to get. You you know, when you come home or when they come home, you're like, ah, anxiety. Is this going to be good or bad? Um, if I say this, is it going to go south? Mm-hmm. You know, and sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But really, you're looking for this kind of intermittent kindness that's happening. Um, it doesn't stick and you can't really pin down how to help them be in better moods or what you can do. If you feel like you're always wrong, if you feel like you can you can just do nothing right, every every problem is your fault um, or you're no longer trusting your own sense of reality, you start to question your own memories. That is a sign of being gaslit, but that also is a sign of just all of these things together kind of combined just leads you down this path of confusion. I wanted to add something really important that I think because we're talking about romantic relationships, it's not exclusive to romantic relationships. Correct. Because I had one with my mom and and I remember feeling intense separation anxiety to where it felt like something bad would happen if we're not together. So I think that's a, do you find that as common that there are people have multiple trauma bonds? Um. People can, absolutely. And I think, I mean, it is important to note in, in what I talk about, I typically talk about um, romantic partnerships, but you can have it with parents, siblings, uh, work, bosses, friends. So they can exist in, in multiple relationships and you can have more than one at one time. Yeah, in my experience, I had one with a parent, too. I can relate to that. But then I later got it with a partner because it was familiar. It was that normal that we talk about. Was it healthy? Was it good? No, but it definitely felt normal. And I I think that might be one thing to keep in mind that we're likely primed to have those relationships again just because of those previous experiences. Mm -hmm. So, Lisa, how did you know or how would you how would you talk to someone else about that space of sort of moving out of the trauma bond or breaking the trauma bond? Like, how do we recognize that? Well, the recognition, once you start to recognize at least the confusion and some of the feelings and the feeling of you constantly having to give, I I describe being in a trauma bond as an intensely draining experience, among many other things, but it's intensely draining. You are giving. And I remember saying, I I have nothing left. I've given you more, more than everything. I, I am beyond empty. I, I, I can't refill myself fast enough to accommodate how much you seem to need from me. So it was, it was so challenging to figure out what I was experiencing and I didn't hear the word trauma bond. So at this stage in my own uh, relationship ending, I didn't know the word. But I did start to figure out that I was in an abusive relationship. It was through um, couples counseling that that I learned that it was abuse. Um, and as I was coming out of it, I, that's when I started to do the research on like, well, why does this feel so hard? That's where the word hit me. Um, to break out of them, I mean, I have three steps and I, it makes it sound so easy, right? It's three easy steps. It's three excruciatingly <laughs> difficult steps. Um, 
the first step, in my view, is clarity and education. So you need to start understanding, like, what is a trauma bond? Why do people stay? You get into why you stay. Because each situation is unique. Yes, it may be a trauma bond, but there's specifics that are just, uh, you know, individuals have different experiences. But you're learning. And what is cognitive dissonance? I think that was something that was absolutely eye-opening to me, was learning what cognitive dissonance really is, the confusion, and that it can be resolved or reduced. You you can't see them as two people. They're one person. So doing work and looking for evidence, true evidence in your life that they are the bad version, not the good version, and that the good exists almost exclusively to facilitate the bad. I mean, I will always admit narcissists are also human beings and they have good days and bad days like anyone. But ultimately, it all serves a purpose. The good fundamentally is manipulative. It's, an, it's meant to keep you. Um, and they groom you over time to receive less and less of the good so that they don't have to put in as much of an effort. So you start recognizing this. You start to resolve the cognitive dissonance through education and clarity and, and looking at the science of a trauma bond, really getting it all. Learning the abuse terms. I mean, I remember it was like a constant little explosion every every new word I learned. It was like, wow, gaslighting. I've never heard that word. That he did it all the time. Exploitative? What's that? It because you some words we know, but you don't think of them in the context of your your relationship. Um, and then some of them more like pop culture words rather than psych words, but like flying monkeys and um, future faking. And these are these are tactics that are used, blame shifting and how it becomes a tactic. We all understand how a person can shift blame, but how someone who is covertly insidiously shifting blame that actually shifts how you think over time. You, you don't you're not able to think clearly and, and completely for yourself anymore because you don't trust yourself. So shaping some of that through the education. My second step is starting to look inwardly. And this is where I really suggest licensed mental health work, um, learning about your unmet needs. Um, uh, internal family systems is a therapy that I really benefited from. Um, learning about what made this feel normal to me. What made this feel comfortable or acceptable or... So really learning about your own childhood and your own responsibility for being here, not responsible for the abuse, for clarity, but responsible for being where you are and not leaving at the first signs. And it's just what made it all feel like it made sense. How did you rationalize it? So you're getting more into your own self and listening to yourself. And then the last step is building a future, but that does not include them. That's mm -hmm. the key. Who is in your support system? Do you have the right support system? Do you need to talk to the support system you have about your needs? So I always say first identify what you need, how you need to be supported, see what you have in your life, and you may need to shape things. You may see some gaps and how can you fill those for yourself? Some people have to figure out where they're going to live. If you're not financially dependent, if you share children, there's so many factors. So my build a future is very customized to people's individual situations, but building that out because I see... Fear is a huge reason why people stay. What, where will I live? How will I support myself? What will I do? Will I be alone forever? We have three kids. Who's going to want me with three little kids? Who, you know, it's this overwhelming fear of the unknown. So you can unpack all of these things. That's why I say it's three steps, but boy, is it not easy steps. But you can, you can break these and learn how to leave. You can learn how to want to leave. Because I deal with a lot of clients who are like, I don't want to leave. I want you to tell me how he can change, which is mm -hmm. not something I can teach, how to change another person that's unteachable. So how did you know when your trauma bond was breaking or that it had broken? I had such a, I mean, I guess everyone had a unique experience, but it, it took me, I, I've, I, I think it took me 14 months. If I really look at the time span and of course, that doesn't mean anything, right? Because some people faster, longer. I think that it took me about 14 months, but there was nine of that at the beginning where we were still talking about staying together. So it was the last five months, which was as close to no contact as possible, that I really felt the shift. How I felt 
that it was breaking was that I no longer found that he was consuming my thoughts. Because there was a time when I was obsessed with staying with him. And then there was a time where I was obsessed with hating him. And it was as I came out of that and I moved from what I see as anger closer to indifference, I started to realize, like, I didn't cry for the last two days. Interesting. Um, he wasn't the first or last thought. I don't, I'm not, I'm not even focused on the anger. Because I had gotten over the, like, thinking about him from reminiscing. I was already past that stage. But I was still, like, obsessively consumed with what he was doing, what he was thinking, and why, and what he was doing to me in post-separation abuse. But you start to feel like you're getting parts of yourself back. You start to realize that you're focusing on yourself. One of the biggest mistakes that, that I think that victims and survivors make in their healing is just focusing all on the abuser. I think that that's very important to do at the beginning so that you can start to understand them insofar as they are who they are and they're not going to change and that a lot of the behavior is intentional. So that's key. But you have to let that go, and which is in my step two. You have to let them go and, and just focus on you. When you are able to do that without having to constantly intentionally use your mind to shift your thoughts back to yourself, when it starts to feel a bit more natural and you're, you notice that, you know, as an example, because we're all right, obsessively reading and on TikTok, and you start to notice your algorithm shifts to rebuilding and healing. You start to notice that the books you're buying are more about you and less about narcissism, more about the healing side of things. This is when you can start to realize it, when you stop crying, when you feel less confused, when you can say he is an abuser, that that's how you can start to see that you're shifting out of it. And I think it's a good a good point to talk about. It's just that move towards responsibility. It's just a different stage of the healing process because we do need that clarity and education like you talked about in your step one. We absolutely do need that. Um, but there comes a point where understanding can just become trying to understand can become just another version of trying to control. Yeah. You know? And I know that you've probably experienced that with plenty of clients, too. How do you deal with clients who um, feel that, for example, like setting boundaries as being like the abuser or actually standing up for themselves as being like the abuser? Mm -hmm. That's so prevalent. And I'm sure we can all relate that's so prevalent. Right. We're, we've been told that we're the problem, we're the abuser. Right. So I think, I mean, it's a few steps, one of which is looking at the difference between, for example, boundaries and ultimatums or threats. What do they sound like? But also deeper than that, what are the intentions behind it? Because we say this as professionals, boundaries are for you, not for them. But I hear a lot, oh, but he, he won't do boundaries. Like he doesn't respect boundaries. Yes, I'm. you didn't even need to say that. Of course they don't. Yes, we do. But it's not about getting them to, like, you don't set a boundary so that they respect your boundary. It's so that you respect your boundary and you hold the consequences of the boundary. But I talk to people about the intention because we we have to assume their intention based on their actions. I don't mean the the survivor, but the abuser. We have to assume that based on their actions, they are doing it intentionally. And to me, again, you're looking for the evidence that they are intending to cause harm, intending to control. And there's always evidence, always lots of evidence in fairness when you're when you're looking. And if you can't see it clearly, this is where coaches and therapists come in and, and help you see this. But then I ask people to look at their own intentions and almost everyone answers my question through the eyes of their abuser. What is your intention? Well, he says, hold on. <laughs> That's not That's not what we asked, right? Talk more about what you believe your intentions are. If your intention is to protect yourself, then you do not have a negative intention. You're not So then it then you deeper have to talk about why do you feel that standing up for yourself and having a boundary is an act of selfishness? Where does that come from? And that's where you have to get more into childhood and and the parenting that you were raised with. Why does this feel normal? How were there boundaries in your house? Did you come from an enmeshed family or a toxic family? Because you have to unlearn some of the beliefs that you hold 
and and also really consider who you are as a person. And if you don't have the intention to gain power and control, then you're not doing it for power and control. And therefore, it's not abusive. It's a boundary. It's not an ultimatum or a threat or a way, to, a, a means to control. Even with the example of stonewalling, you know, some people will say, like, I don't talk to him when he's being abusive. And then he says, I'm stonewalling him. Yeah. I've heard that a thousand times. It happens all the time and it happened to me. But is it stonewalling? Because again, stonewalling is an intentional behavior in order to freeze someone out, to make them feel isolated, to make them feel unheard, to hurt them, to control them through manipulation. You are withdrawing yourself from an abusive situation and not engaging in arguments in order to keep your peace. You're not like, ooh, this is going to hurt him. You're like, oh my God, this is too painful for me. I can't do this. So there's a difference, but you have to be maybe sometimes walked through it and have it explained because, again, your reality has been their reality. You've been living in their world for so long that you struggle to see any reality and you struggle to trust your own intentions because they tell you that your intentions are wrong. And you and because of the trauma bond, you trust them. So you're able to believe them until you start to come out of it. And that's that's that tricky part where you're coming out of the fog. You're still in it. You're still confused, but you're coming out. So it takes a long time. And I see a lot of victims um, of abuse. It takes a long time to to come out of it because you have these little mini epiphanies throughout the healing of like, oh, that too. And you're right. And so, again, it really helps to have somebody help you step through this process. What do you think is the biggest obstacle people face when they're when they are breaking a trauma bond? What's the most common issue that comes up that really trips them? To me, it's cognitive dissonance. If I had to pick one, it's the confusion of seeing them as two different people. It's it, I can't even articulate in words how hard that was for me to overcome of just let go of all of the excuses because sometimes the 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 trauma is true. Now, I have seen made up trauma with narcissistic people, but for the most part, we can agree that they've been through something traumatic. That's part of the reason that they are the way they are, not the whole reason, but part of it. And we have to let that go and realize that the reasons that they're being abusive don't matter. They are abusive. Their actions and their behaviors support you saying, I am in an abusive relationship. This person is harmful. This person hurts me. They're doing it intentionally. You need to move your your line of thinking to this one version. So for anyone to really pick that one first thing to focus on, to me, it's cognitive dissonance and resolving or re at least reducing over time how you see them. They are not good. Period. So Lisa, it sounds like you did, I'm guessing, limited contact or as close to no contact as possible. Is that what you would recommend someone trying to really break it and start a healing process? And would you recommend no contact over limited contact or depending on the situation? I recommend no contact about as loudly and fiercely as I'm able. Um, <laughs> I I believe that to be the best way because you, if, if they have even just a little bit of access to you, they are going to use every opportunity to create these emotional uh, interactions that just suck you back into the cycle. And it could be future faking and it could be love bombing and it could be all this breadcrumbing, right? All these pop culture words. But but it also could be that they're trying to hurt you, right? I mean, oh, oh it's sort of a weird way to be hoovered, but they will try to suck you back in sometimes through insulting you and hurting you. Regardless, you're getting sucked into the emotion. So no contact is the best thing you can do. But naturally, the next thing people say is, but we share children. Now, mm -hmm. I was no contact for two years with children. So for absolute clarity, when people say it can't be done, it unequivocally, indisputably can be done. And I know many people that are doing it. And there are unique situations where it can't be done. And I get that. Um, even in terms of, because where people go is legally, right? Court-wise, you can't, if he goes into court and says, she won't even talk to me. In my experience, professionally and personally, judges are not actually looking at whether or not you two are speaking. If you have enough evidence of abusiveness in writing or enough testimony, because that also is relevant in court, what you say, I have chosen to go no contact. However, 
the other person has access to the children in the following ways. It's about access to the children, and it is about a healthy co-parenting relationship. That matters. Family court, there's two pieces to it. Access to the children and, the, and how the children are experiencing it, but how the two co-parents are able to work together. So in some cases, you might have to go limited contact, um, at least through your situation in family court, which, again, is incredibly difficult because in litigation, if you're highly emotional, you make mistakes, you say you need to be sh really careful. So I'm a huge advocate for parenting apps and ensuring that the conversations take place in writing so that everything is documented and there is no gaslighting can't take place because you can just reference the written conversations. Um, so I do I make content on how to go limited contact, but no contact is the best thing you could possibly do. And if you're not able, go limited contact, which means you're essentially in short, you're just talking about the kids, nothing else. They could say a million things. You ignore everything. You respond to the one thing that was about the kids. Ignore everything else. And then you go screen with your sister or your mother or your best friend or your therapist, but you don't react to them. Yeah, I too went limited contact. So I, I totally get it from both sides. Um, for those of us who are here in the United States, it is important to use things like the parenting apps, like Lisa mentioned. It can also be helpful to make sure that if you are using text messages that you do not have their text message saved with their name have it be with their phone number like doing things like that to protect yourself so if you are submitting something to court or whatever it's it's they can't argue oh that wasn't me it, it wasn't that you know they you know they're just save someone else and someone else said that like making sure you're doing those things to protect yourself do it through email whatever you can to protect yourself and also being aware of what your state's rights are as far as recording so my state is a one party recording. So I'm I'm one party. I can decide to record it if and when I want. And that can be admissible in court. But other states, it's a two party recording. So just making sure if you choose to do limited or no contact that you are doing those protections to take care of yourself, whatever you decide. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to what's the best thing the person can do to start the healing? What would be the first like big step that you would tell somebody besides we already say no contact, but what else really helps? I would guess look at Lisa's content too. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? Is it right? Say that? <laughs> yes. Um, but I think, I mean, more than anything, as I said before, it's about the education. So how? What does that mean? What is education? If you can get into therapy, meaning if that is a resource that is financially available to you, therapy or coaching niche, meaning someone who's really been through this before. Um, and, you know, Carrie knows this because we've talked about it, but not all therapists are qualified to talk about narcissistic abuse or trauma bonds or abuse or domestic violence in any capacity and do not have any skill set to recognize what's actually happening. So if you're at the stage where you recognize what's happening, if that's where you're at, then it's easier to find a therapist because you can actually say, like, what is your experience in dealing with victims of abuse? Um, but that said, coaching, therapy, ideally, but either, uh, depending on what you can afford, as I said, you can also do reading um, YouTube videos. There's, you know, follow Dr. Romani. She's incredible. Um, you know, a renowned expert on the subject of it. But Reading, Why Does He Do That by Lundy Bancroft, still one of my most favorite books on the subject because it's not about narcissistic abuse, it's about abuse. And I actually, his subtitle always sticks with me of Inside the Minds of Angry and Controlling Men because all you're thinking is like, he's got anger issues or maybe he, that book will take all of your maybe he and it just obliterates every excuse that he's made for himself and that you've made for them. So that's important but binge watching content on it there's so many great creators who talk about the subject yes i'm one of them at stronger than before in case anyone's wondering but um <laughs> but you know you want to learn about it and listen to the people who are talking about how to break out of it too not just this is what they do but how do you move past it so starting to really get that education get out of the fog through education and clarity I remember that that initial phase, I felt so, so consumed 
by the thought of this person. What are they doing? Where are they at? How happy? How, what are they, everything that I even found that I had to focus on a minute by minute moment there for a while because it was too consuming. Is that a common experience that you see is that it's like literally, I've heard it compared to breaking an addiction. I haven't broken addiction, but it, I'll tell you, it was one of the toughest things I've ever done personally, the, the amount of discipline I had to show. Yeah. Um, it is compared more often than not, I mean, to addiction, but specifically to a heroin addiction. Um, and it's funny because obviously I say that and I've never done heroin and I've never spoken to a person who's done heroin uh, until a year ago. I spoke now to someone who did heroin. <laughs> there and I, and I'm, a, I'm a recovering drug addict, so now you have to. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. And so when I heard from this person that when I was describing the feelings of addiction, he was like, that sounds like a heroin addiction. And I said, funny you say that because it's compared to a heroin addiction. And he was like, I would know. And that was an eye-opening conversation. But the addictiveness of it is shocking because you think, Look, I'm not addicted to a person. That's ridiculous. But it's not really that you're addicted to the person specifically. You're addicted to the cycle and the and the, the chemicals in you. I get it. You know, the difference. But you are breaking an addiction. And so, what, Terry, when you're talking about the discipline, like, my goodness, the discipline, minute by minute, you have to reshift and 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 focus. So I will always say to people, you need to work on your own recovery. So you need to focus on healing and, and learning and, and there's so much to do, but you can't let it consume every minute of your day. You need to be able to have other things that are going on in your life that are not about that. You need to decide that you are not going to talk about him today. You are not going to talk about it with certain people. You are going to try to, not not that you want to keep it to yourself, but you want to not obsessively just dump on every single person around you, constantly eat, sleep, and breathe it. Because you start to, well, I was going to say you start to lose yourself. You've kind of already lost yourself, but you are continuing to lose yourself further. So you you're, you need to focus on getting yourself back. So yes, focus on it. There came a point where I was like freaking out about certain things that were going on, something he did, whatever. I actually started assigning times like Friday afternoon. I don't have anything. So I'm going to set aside some time to just be sad and research and watch videos and do what I need to do. Because right now I have a job right now. I need to focus on my kids right now. I need to. So I know there's a point early in the recovery where that's kind of not possible, but the discipline to get yourself to a place where you can selectively choose times where you're able to focus on the abuse and healing and times where you can focus on your real life and your future. Yeah. We actually talk about that in a self-help tip. We call it, well, you, you think, you, Sarah, you call it a containment exercise. I said, I call it make a date with pain. Where you you set a timer <laughs> and you literally like allow yourself a set amount of time. And then when it's done, you move on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I... Where did I? It was my therapist. I'm like, where did I learn that? It was my therapist. So that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would. She didn't call it that, but that's exactly what it is. You make a date with pain and you're like Friday night at 5 p.m. I'm alone for two hours and I'm going to cry. Tara, any last questions for her before we wrap up today? I was going to ask, uh, do you have any resources or do you have any suggestions for resources for people? Maybe if they are wondering if they're in a trauma bond. I mean, you mentioned, you know, Lundy Bancrafts, you know. Why does he do that? But are there any others that you might suggest that maybe for the people who are aware that something's wrong or not right versus the people who might who might be wanting that education piece for about trauma bonds? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, to sort of selfishly plug myself here, but I have a quiz on my website, strongerthanbefore.ca, and it's on the resources tab. You can click for a free two minute quiz, it gives you instant results, and it's am I in a trauma bond? So it it answers the question really, really well. You get your instant result if you're in one or not. If you're not sure, that would help you. If you discover that you're in one, um, I have a course, as you mentioned in the intro, um, called the Trauma Bond Recovery Course. It's a 12-week online program. It's affordable and it's self-paced. I love that about the course that you, there's not homework. There's not weekly check-ins. There's no Zoom meetings. You do it when you have time can't do it faster than 12 weeks, but you can do it slower than 12 weeks. So feel free to take your time. But it teaches you the the three steps, which there are multiple steps underneath, but it teaches you over the 12 weeks, all of the things that you need to know 
to really be able to have the tools to get yourself out. Um, and then I also have several books um, that that are helping people quite a bit. So the Trauma Bond Recovery Journal is the first one. Um, I have another one called Rebuilding After a Trauma Bond, sort of more set for once you've broken it. Um, and then a new book that I have uh, co-authored with Carrie called Surviving to Thriving. Um, and that one takes you through the six biggest obstacles that victims and survivors are facing while they're breaking the trauma bond and, and just kind of coming out of it, This this the things that keep you stuck. Um, and then my most recent one called Narcissism Unmasked, that is kind of an A to Z handbook of all the different tactics that narcissistic people and abusive people use against you so that you can really start to see what is happening clearly and learn all the terms in one place and kind of have it as a reference guide throughout your recovery. And then eventually you put all that stuff away. You do the last book, the rebuilding one, and then, you know, from there, poof, every, everything's great. I see so many survivors, um, once you're able to get through some of these resources and start to really focus on yourself and heal, life gets exponentially better at the end of it all. Ev everything is better and you can't, you look back and you can't believe that you were ever that person, that you were ever in that kind of relationship, that you ever let it happen. Not that we are letting it happen, but that's how you feel at the end of it all. So it's always a good thing to really try to get yourself out. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us this incredible resources. I know it's really important. I know that so many people who are listening have been struggling with this and it's, it's, it sounds kind of mysterious. I mean, we may, it is what we experience is our lived experience, but I know that the, just the term can be really kind of scary. So I appreciate you giving us sort of an insight perspective, but also help to know how that we're getting out of it. And I, I really appreciate the input today. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And again, if people want to find you, where can they where can they find your platform or find this information? So firstly, my website is strongerthanbefore.ca. And I'm also on all platforms as Stronger Than Before. On Instagram, it's Stronger Than Before Coach, but everywhere it's Stronger Than Before. And you can find me on all platforms. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Right. Today's interview with Lisa was fascinating. I particularly love the specifics she gave for how to recognize confusion as being a major sign of being in a trauma bond. What did you take away from her interview? You can let us know by emailing us at hello at breakingfreewithcarrietierra.com. If you haven't yet, make sure you follow or subscribe, write us a review, and if you know someone who would benefit from this episode, make sure to share it with them. If you're not following us on social media yet, you can follow me at tara.relationshipcoach and Carrie at Carrie McAvoy PhD. And we will see you back here next time.